So we are all welcome to our responsible AI Network Africa workshop. The Responsible AI Network Africa is a collaborative initiative between the Technical University of Munich, Germany, and the Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We are of the firm opinion that artificial intelligence has a significant role to play as far as driving the fourth industrial revolution is concerned. And so we bring together AI enthusiasts with the objective of deliberating on how we can leverage on AI to drive the fourth industrial revolution. Even though we realize that there are a lot of positives as far as AI is concerned, there are ethical considerations. And that is the reason why day in, day out, we come together to deliberate on how we can responsibly use AI for the good of humanity. These workshops have been ongoing, and today we are going to be focusing on responsible AI and startups. Responsible AI and startups. I have the privilege of introducing to us the moderator for today's event in the person of Lavina Ram Kison. Lavina Ram Kison. Uh, let me say a few things about Ra Lavina and then I will hand over to her. Lavina has harvested a blended spread between multidisciplinary, multi sector, and multi technology. Currently, she holds the position as chairperson for Empire Partner Foundation and Responsible AI, with a passion to unlock and be the consciousness for Africa in artificial intelligence. Her areas include strategy, technology, psychology, which expand into artificial intelligence, blockchain, and ethics while developing skills to humanize technology. Mentoring students to business in the field of AI ethics, applied AI, applied med technologies, augmented reality and virtual reality, IoT, robotics, are what keeps Lavina busy all the time. Other areas include Startup growth acceleration, ideation, all things AI, blockchain, and venture investing. My dear colleagues, before I hand over to Lavina, I will want to bring to your attention that this particular work. Thank you so much for that, um, Jerry. Uh, that was being very kind. Um, let me extend a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, and thank you so much for joining us at the Rain Africa workshop, where we wish to unpack uh, responsible AI and uh, startups and what that exactly means. Um, so in today's panel, we have quite an astute um, panel put together. Uh, and I wish to thank them for their time. Just to give everyone a bit of a heads up in terms of the format or the flow. Um, so I'll introduce each of the different speakers and then they'll have uh, five to seven minutes to kind of give a brief presentation around their thoughts around it. And then we'll go into the panel discussion and questions and answers uh, together with some applied use cases. And then we'll do a bit of closing um, thereafter. So, um, just to share some thoughts uh, around responsible um, AI. For me, it's been very much a question of, um, is it a fairy tale or is it something that um, 
actually does exist? Um, and if so, to what extent? So for me, uh, it has always been um, pretty much around human responsibility. That human responsibility is That human responsibility is around uh, us developing intellectual systems together with our human principles. And what exactly does that then mean? Um, are we putting ourselves in the same breath um, as these intelligent beings? Um, are we then held responsible for these intelligent beings or do we allow them to be responsible for themselves? Um, in, in essence, for me, um, this has unpacked a whole lot of other questions, especially within the African context. Um, I think we have always heard around the different applications from healthcare and pharma genomics to nanotechnologies or even agriculture when it comes to ecological footprints or even crop yielding predictions uh, through to education and uh, it's sort of venturing on gaming and AR and VR. So in all of this, where do we stand? What do we need? And how do we actually get it done? So very much to Jerry's point around what are the foundational blocks for all of this um, around responsible innovation? And I believe it's very much existing around the risks, the ethics, the trust, and the responsibility. Uh, responsibility has many legs. That responsibility includes cultural, ethics, morals, legal, as well as social economics. So without further ado, um, Africa is speaking and are we ready to listen? So let me introduce our panel. Uh, let's start with Ms. Ida. Uh, Ms. Ida is a global president for the Global Council of Promotion and Trade. She holds a position of regional head in Anglophone countries and UNESCO's emerging technology. She is also certified leadership and management. So we look forward to your thoughts, Ida. Uh, next, we have uh, Jessica. Uh, Jessica is the co-founder and the VP of Growth of Brave. And it is an HR tech company that is building a workforce and planning apps for managers to bet on the right kind of mix of people uh, so that they can complete a project and hit the target. She's very passionate around ecosystems that arise and evolve over time and has built various communities over the last 10 years from startups, developers, corporates, investors, as well as being part of the founding teams. So thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Jessica. And last but not least is Mr. John who is a tech, tech entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience. And his current focus has been around smart technologies, which can be leveraged in solving some of the most prominent and pertinent socioeconomic challenges within Africa, and how these various players can then play a role through the empowerment of the existing structures and systems to build a holistic, sustainable ecosystem in terms of solving our problems. So I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Ida to take the floor. Thank you so much, Lavina. That was a really wonderful um, welcome. I'm, I'm, I feel honored and I am just glad to be amongst such people who are looking into creating solutions as we go. Because there's one thing that we have learned being in the tech community and it is that sometimes we leave things a bit too late. But in the current era, let's say for the, for the past five years or so, I've been seeing solutions being created as well as the ethical and moral imprint being created alongside it. And for me, I think it's a great step for man, seeing that in the past, probably we were a bit selfish in the way that we approached technology, looking at it as a way to solve our immediate problems mostly individual or mostly from our own localities, but ignoring the, the issues that came about with what kind of inequalities might be propagated as a result of the technologies 
that we are building and also how sustainable are we, how sustainably are we able to work with other stakeholders? It's really exciting for me to see these kinds of conversations, Lavinia and Jerry and Kathleen, because, and of course my fellow speakers, because it's something that is very close to my heart and I'm just glad to be part of this moment in time. You have already given an introduction for me. So uh, I don't believe I will go into um, what I had prepared. Probably I will first give a chance for my co-presenters to introduce themselves so that we are all on the same page. And then we can go deeper into the discussions as for all our own opinions and viewpoints. So thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ida. Um, just to sort of uh, give everyone a uh, brief um, outline the, or, or awareness, um, the session is actually being recorded um, just for everyone's information. Um, so if I can um, sort of ask Miss Jessica to come um, to say a few words, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Lavinia. Can you hear me? Can Yes, we can. Okay, I'm going to uh, just be on voice uh, because my internet has been going down if I enable video. So uh, please bear with me, everyone. Uh, uh, Lavinia gave a really good uh, uh, introduction uh, about my background. So I actually come from a computer science background, but uh, that background has evolved into uh, business background over the last uh, decade or so, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a brief uh, intro uh, into what we are doing as a company, and uh, my presentation won't reflect directly on what we're doing in HR, but more into a space, the agri-space, where um, the use of AI has been used and how responsible can our startups and the users of it can be in terms of uh, UV, a, UAVs like drones and uh, precision agriculture. But uh, what, we, what we realized is, um, first and foremost, before I actually I go into the lessons learned, um, I was uh, part of the founding team at iHerb 10 years ago in 2010, and this gave the rise of the startup ecosystem in Kenya, as you call it today, the Silicon Savannah. I left after six years and started an HR company called Brave. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to use AI we were trying to use AI to actually place candidates. Uh, and, uh, and what we realized is that AI can really never 100% uh, replace uh, the human touch. So I think uh, as we go into this uh, conversation, we need to think about points like how much AI can we really use in our lives today and to what extent can we use it? Because I will tell you till today, the HR tech space, the recruiting space still uses a human touch to actually place candidates up to the sea level space. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, and for information, I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. Perfect. Thank you so very much, Ms. Jessica. Um, if I could open up the floor to Mr. John now. Please come and join us. Hi, John, are you with us? Okay, I guess while we're waiting for John to reconnect, um, if we can um, sort of just uh, play a bit of a game. Um, and, and, and this would literally be, you know, uh, two to three words that you think of uh, when you think of the word uh, responsible. Um, so Ida and uh, Jessica, and for all the participants, if you could put in some comments uh, in the chat, uh, what are uh, one or two words that come to mind when we speak of the word responsible? Uh, 
Hello, I'm back. Uh, hi, John. Perfect. Hello. There you go. The floor is yours. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, it seems like we've uh, lost uh, John again. So maybe if I can... Um, sort of revert back to the question. So Ida and um, uh, Ms. Jessica, if you can give me one or two words that come to mind when we talk about the word responsible. Uh, for me, the first thing that came to mind, I typed it in the chat was like uh, being accountable uh, for what you are putting out there. Yes. And I see we have a response from um, a Shannon who says it's responsible plus acknowledge plus recognize, which kind of ties up um, that very nicely, um, Ms. Ida. Um, yeah, I agree with everyone. Actually, when you talk about accountability, definitely um, that is part of being responsible. And then I would just like to add that inclus inclusivity is something that I would definitely put up there as well as reliability and safety. Okay, perfect. While I still have you here, um, Ms. Ida, uh, if we can sort of uh, dive into the questions a little bit. Um, in search for the excellence of all our ecosystems that we continuously strive towards, together with the leapfro leapfrogging that everyone talks about for Africa, uh, what can we urge uh, governments, regulators, entrepreneurs to do uh, to prevent these widening gaps that keep occurring? That's a big question. <laughs> Feel free to segment it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a big question and it involves everyone. And I'm glad that you, you mentioned government because um, here we are talking about the, the, the policy makers, the makers of policy. And just for you to start from that point for me is exciting because uh, government is in charge of creating uh, an environment that is enabling, enabling for everyone else, enabling for the startups and innovators, enabling for academia and the kind of research that is being undertaken, and enabling actually for everyone else, be it civil society, so that what people can be able to engage in a way that is um, free and open. And yeah, it can be a bit of uh, a, a a bit tough, definitely, because most of the times when we talk about technology, government comes behind. It's usually um, the tech community and innovators who push for the solutions, and then you find that government is playing a catch-up game. And this is because government is not per se invested in terms of the knowledge transfer. But that is not, that is not, there's no reason why government should, should not be involved in the knowledge transfer and even be part of um, building an ecosystem that encourages innovation. So for me, I just feel that some of the inequalities we have found in the past is because government was coming in a bit too late and was not in a position to be openly transparent in saying that, listen, we don't seem to have a hang of what the technology is all about. And that kind of transparency is what is needed right now. It doesn't matter whether you're too late in the game, you need to say, this is what is at stake for me and I need to be engaged and involved. And if anyone is still not comfortable with the technology, there are many other ways to engage. We are having academia, for example, coming in with the research in, on what exactly it means to be ethical and moral when it comes to not only AI, but emerging technologies. And this is the kind of leaf that I would like government and policymakers to borrow. For my fellow innovators, definitely I was an innovator before I went into the international community. So I understand my brothers and sisters when they say it can be very frustrating when they say that most of these rules are being put in place to stop them or to earn from them even before one has been able to get off the ground. These are sentiments that are very, very, um, I believe authentic. 
and this is the reason why we have to start talking about it now let's bring everyone onto the table and let's say what how is this affecting you as an individual or as a stakeholder for example when it comes to privacy issues privacy issues it's not only the the consumer or the user who should be concerned about this i believe that even the human rights organizations should be at the forefront of pushing for this for this before it goes too far but i will not go i will go into the principles there are some principles basic basic principles when it comes to responsible ai that i'd like to discuss but first i guess i would just like to my colleagues to also give their viewpoints as we go on thank you okay perfect thank you so very much um for that answer uh if i can invite uh, miss jessica and uh, mr john uh to share their viewpoints on that Lavinia, in terms of the government involvement specifically? Um, no, just in terms of being able to have, um, you know, that excellent ecosystem that everybody is talking around and wanting to achieve. Um, what is it um, for you that we could do to lessen the gaps between governments, regulators, entrepreneurs, to actually make this um, really a successful ecosystem? Hmm. The, the like like uh, I just said that's a tough one because um, see government is the role of uh, government and academia is seen in the is seen as uh, regulation. It's seen as providing frameworks, right? So the moment um, the moment entrepreneurs. Uh, view such players, they immediately want to either stay away or either want to engage, but mostly they want to engage. Uh, a recent example was like uh, with the formation of the, uh, bit, uh, the, uh, the blockchain um, a protocol um, committee that was about uh, two years ago. The government of Kenya did call players from different industries to be part of it and contribute to a plat, uh, to an assessment framework of how blockchain could be used uh, in terms of smart contracts in in this part of the world. And a uh, framework like that is very usable. That's actually a very responsible uh, framework. But to what extent we use it to uh, in 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 the application of like land contracts, for example, I think that that's where like we actually suffer in Kenya, uh, the use of land land uh, land land uh, title deeds as well. So that that's an, a, a perfect example. But uh, there's there's hesitation. There's a lot of hesitation because uh, as an entrepreneur myself, I first in a lot of call to participation in uh, for government, not really AI or technology, but other frameworks for like tax and the uh, digital tax service that was just introduced lately this year. And they were still going to introduce introduce that 1.5% on every uh, online uh, trans uh, transaction. Uh, that you make. So there's a lot of hesitance, right? So academia and government are seen like, also it's supposed to be accountable, but then there's resistance. So these, the words like reliability and transparency and fairness have no uh, kind of, or integrity have no withstanding with, with them bringing together, uh, bringing them together as an ecosystem. So that's why you find startups going off uh, and starting their own innovations. Like um, we have a very good example locally whereby uh, BitPesa, which is a blockchain um, company that started in Nairobi uh, about six to seven years ago, pulled out because uh, the government really didn't understand smart contracts at that time. And then it had a lawsuit with a telco and then they set up their uh, H2 in uh, in Europe where it was uh, it was more understood and they could actually like do uh, exchange transparently 
and responsib uh, responsibly in a way that uh, the ecosystem understood uh, by a different continent. So I think this is some of, we are still at uh, early stages when it comes to this part of the world of responsible AI and how far it can be used because five years ago, uh, again, uh, U UAV or drones were banned. Now they've been introduced back to government to, uh, and you have to have a license to use the drones, but they've been uh, introduced back by, into government to actually say it can be used in agriculture. Check Rwanda, for example, using zip line to actually uh, ship uh, blood or medical supplies uh, via zip line to different areas around the Rwandan uh, villages, for example. So I think yeah. they yeah, there's just uh, a kind of uh, governments either reactive uh, in, this, in, in most cases because they don't understand um, most of the applications that a responsible AI can, can, can do have. And having these task force communities uh, does help to some extent, but also uh, startups get uh, a bit infuriated by the time it takes to get out the report. It takes about a year or two to get out the report. So they're off doing their own thing and they've actually surpassed what uh, can happen with uh, collaboration of like the triple helix or a hybrid of it. Yeah, no, perfect. Uh, I mean, you know, to your point of, um, you know, the applications of it, Absolutely. I think uh, Albert Einstein has one of his famous sayings, which says that we cannot solve the, uh, our problems with the same kind of thinking we used to create them. And this is such a case in point of exactly that. Um, you know, uh, even extending to your example, I think, uh, you know, vaccines have been one of those most con uh, con um, contentious issues uh, at this point in time or whether or not uh, and how responsible we are in terms of the deployment of it, in terms of who gets the usage, when, how, you know, you know, even within Africa, each of the different countries um, play a complete different role uh, when it comes to that and everyone has a different outlook. So, you know, at some point it's about us trying to get this collective view together um, to drive the continent more forward. Um, and you know, talking about the regulators, it kind of brings me back to the point of uh, digital citizenry, and you know how important, uh, for example, uh, GDPR and data privacy and policies are, and the actual adoptions within Africa. And I think uh, one of the most recent examples uh, that were given uh, or studies um, mentioned that there were only six countries out of the 54 that we have in Africa that have adopted some form of a data security or data privacy policy um, across the, the continent. Um, I mean, Ms. Ida, what are your thoughts around this? Okay, um, you said the current data says, says six countries? Yeah, out six countries out of 54. Yeah, that's it, that have okay. adopted something uh, in forms of yeah. uh, data privacy. Okay, um, from the history of the African Union, even to get um, six countries in such a short time is, is, is an improvement because it's, it's always been really, really hard. And I'm not even talking about tech. I'm talking about things like the Maputo Protocol, which was about women, women's empowerment, and of course the gender equality and um, many others. Just to get those protocols ratified by all 54 countries is usually an uphill task. So if this is something which is new, then it's going to take more than, um, you know, I mean, I believe that these countries will have to be engaged and engaged meaning meaningfully because I have a feeling that they do not really have the expertise that is needed to sit on the table and come up and make such decisions. Well, of course, we have countries like Kenya and I believe South Africa, Egypt, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, being at the forefront of these technologies. But can you imagine all the other countries? We just have the same countries being mentioned over and over again. What is that saying about where are the other countries being left behind? And um, who is going to build their capacity if the rest of the, the other the, the countries at the forefront are just going to continue forging ahead because tech 
so dynamic that things just keep on changing. So I believe yeah. that that is a wake up call. Yeah, it just means that we need to start engaging. We also, when I say we, I think we need to start first by determining who is going to engage with them. I believe the people uh, who should be at the forefront of this are the African Union. I also believe that the African Union might be challenged itself in terms of the, the technological advancement that is being made. So it might have to engage directly with the tech community, be it the private sector or the development partners who are already way ahead when it comes to building an enabling environment for tech. And that would be a chance now to get the other countries to play catch up. Remember, you cannot ratify something which you don't even understand. I've talked about one protocol which was barely understood and it took so long, but this is something which I'm just saying, even for people who understand context, to get ratification is usually a political maneuver and it's usually about uh, how well you do it in terms of how good you are at diplomacy and playing the game of politics. And yes. sadly, that's just the way it is. And I, I think we need to accept that. So we might need a different approach than the one that we've been using before in, this, in the innovation system where we've been saying everyone is going to gain anyway, you should be yes. at the table. Here we have to look at the political scenario, engage the people who are really experts at playing the game, people who are experts at winning people over when it comes to explaining what kind of polit political gains and wins are in uh, are at stake for this particular um, states, uh, as in the, the governments that are going to be involved here. Yeah. yeah, no, perfect. Uh, I think, you know, if we can uh, take from that and apply it to startups uh, and that startup environment, uh, we tend to think about um, some of the hiccups that startups have to face within Africa, right? Um, leave alone responsible applications of AI as a startup, right? Um, and, and some of those kind of uh, resonate around infrastructure, uh, regulation or laws, um, skills, culture, uh, access to investments. Those are just some that we could name um, on the top of our head. But if we dive a little bit deeper into probably a combination of the soft skills versus the hard skills that startups can actually walk away with, uh, what would be some of your advice um, to them? Is that to me? I'd invite uh, either, uh, either Miss Ida or Miss Jessica. For me, negotiation. And I think Jessica is gonna add to this, definitely being that, yeah, <laughs> being that she's very passionate, obviously. she's very passionate, yeah. Negotiation <laughs> skills, yeah. These are some of the things that are left out yeah. of the, the learning when it comes to, you know, innovators and entrepreneurs. If you cannot negotiate, then it's your chances of even succeeding, even in terms of your own, in your own space, be, be the niche that you have created for yourself. Uh, is going to be very difficult. So for me, I just say that these are some of the skills we need to build. Perfect, thank you. Ms. Jessica? So uh, some of the, uh, let's, let's go to the hard skills, right? Um, AI is a, is a word that was thrown around in the last decade as a very sexy word, artificial intelligence as, as it uh, comes, right? The first thing I think about is the computer scientist. I think about the Turing machine or uh, Lady Ada Lovelace, who's like one of the very few computer scientists who are celebrated. So AI first came into existence. Let's go to the history of it through like uh, through the war, right? Germany and England during during the First World War the Enigma machine and, um, and, and, and learning how to build AI is not for the faint hearted that I can say that. Um, AI is um, something that actually has to be very deeply understood and learned. You can, there's a data science side of it, but uh, we, when we go into deep learning, 
And uh, my co-founder, Danielle, she's our chief scientist and she's really like the expert on our team. Uh, some of the things she does are, is beyond me because she's the real AI expert. And this agent-based modeling and all different models that uh, you have to think about. It's like being an, an economist plus a practical uh, application into one. So when we think about the use of AI, and I really wish I could actually do the, the presentation much later to show like how simple it could be and how, uh, how um, uh, complex it can be. Um, the, I don't know, the, 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 there was a meme running uh, on uh, social media about Uber's uh, uh, back channels and how uh, like you think a car gets from point A to point B. Now Uber actually have like a lot of uh, servers and systems running behind the platform for uh, for requests like that. So that's actually one example of the use of AI crunching large amounts of uh, petabytes or even terabytes or more of data to actually uh, like get you the right rider. So the hard skills that are needed and which I feel like are lacking so far in some candidates that really need, and this part of the world for like really deep learning and the application of AI into agriculture and uh, other fields like health, healthcare. But I'm talking on the tax side, not 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 the medical side for now, are, are more of like the critical learning uh, side of things uh the logic and i think i think logic is re related to the critical side of things uh thinking there's a lot of copy paste mentality uh going on and um it's sad to see that sometimes uh in assessments uh as well so i think we have what you call like software developers who can just develop software and we have software engineers who go into the problem and really solve the logic of it so we uh, the creativity uh, side of this, the ability to build models and actually put it in practical is, is still very nascent in this part of the world. And that's why we have um, our universities trying to uh, launch what we call like masters of data science right now or code academies uh, trying to do three to six months uh, data science courses on how you can use R or how you can use Python for simple data science uh, activities. But I think far and most, we are really, really far uh, from where we need to be in terms of like uh, the, glo the, the global south, as we call it. Yeah. Wow, perfect. Thanks so much for that. Um, you know, carrying on with uh, startups. Uh, where does one actually start on this journey um, in responsible AI? I mean, a lot of us have spoken around uh, cultural mindsets. Um, and I guess the pandemic has also taught us that large tech giants, um, you know, also are allowed to fail uh, in certain arenas um, when it comes to responsible AI. Um, so how do we as entrepreneurs or startups actually begin this journey within the continent? Um, and, and what exactly is needed or what is our toolkit that we may need to carry with us on this journey? Uh, Ms. Aida? Right. Uh, you're talking about the startup journey, right? Yeah, and startups or, or entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, number one, pitching the, the 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 ethical and the moral perspective of it is usually a challenge when you're talking to startups and entrepreneurs. Now, I've I've been I've been in the innovation space and I've 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 been able to exit successfully before I joined the organizations that I work with now, and it was very tough for me to put such things as part as a priority in terms of my learning journey because I just needed to to get the business running and I needed to get investors on board and I needed to 
get the customers on board definitely that's like an uphill struggle every day um you know just to get the business to work and to be successful and so the last thing that i was thinking about at that particular time was the ethics and the moral um perspective of it and i'm just talking honestly and authentically so if i'm going to talk about startups and entrepreneurs right now i think we need to engage, but maybe engage startups and entrepreneurs in the spaces we used to engage before. And this was at meetups. We had meetups happening like almost every day. We had um, what is currently happening now in term, terms of webinars and, and online meetings was just part of, of our everyday lives. This is how we used to collaborate with other innovators, with other, with, with other entrepreneurs or with whoever else we might need on board. So uh, the bigger conversations, I'm lucky because uh, even before I was, uh, I, I, before I went into tech, I, I had already done policy. And I went into tech purely as just to, as a passion, just something that I did to solve. My whole family is in tech and engineering. So, but for me, I had already, had a feel of policy i had already done policy and when i started going into tech as just for my own personal gain not for anyone to tell me what to do in terms of what i'm going to do with my life i just found that there are many things that people don't understand and one is how policy affects uh the everyday life of an entrepreneur so uh i might be comfortable in understanding the policy and and, and understanding the tech ecosystem, but not everyone is so lucky. And even for me, it was still tough trying to wrap my head around what is a priority for me, you know? So if we're going to talk to startups and entrepreneurs, and if we're going to start talking about ethics and, you know, why don't you start thinking about, you need to be held accountable, you need to, to be responsible, or you need to respond and, uh, in, a, in a way that does not create more inequalities not only for your consumers, but also for the for the world at large, then this is a conversation that needs to happen now. And remember that their priorities might be different. This is from my own personal perspective. So we might need to make it engaging and maybe look at it in a way that for me, what would have caught my attention is if someone had told me, if you do not put this in place, then it's going to affect your business. I know you're planning to exit in the next six, seven years, but you can be sure that you're going to have created a problem for the people who are going to come on board if you do not put this in place. That would have caught my attention. So mm. I think we need to be realistic about that. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think just to quote uh, one of Steve Jobs' uh, most famous uh, um, quotes, it says that innovation is having to say no to a thousand things. So as startups, you know, I think we find ourselves in, in, in somewhat of a key uh, area uh, to be able to have the ability to say no, but then also to understand what impact we're creating, right? How far exactly. does our impact actually go? Um, you know, a lot of this uh, for me, from my psychological perspective, uh, has always been, uh, what is your core? So, you know, each individual person is held responsible or thinks responsibly. And those things mean very different things to each and every single one of us. And added to that, we have the complex diversity within Africa. Um, you know, all the different cultures, all the different dialects um, added above that. And how do we find that common ground around it? Um, so, you know, I think going back to, um, you know, reflecting upon the pandemic, uh, it's obviously allowed us to, uh, to have a faster adoption rate around digital transformation. So, um, Ms. Jessica, if you could give a startup some advice, how to better manage their digital space, um, how, what advice would you give them? Uh, when you say how to uh, better manage their digital space, uh, is it like the, uh, when they actually want to use AI or uh, just any technology in general? It could be either or, absolutely. Mm. You know, there's something interesting. A friend of mine uh, formed a startup called The Unintended Consequences of Technology. And I was like, why would you start something like that? And, you know, I didn't understand it five years ago. 
uh, but I understand it now. Um, let's. Uh, I'll just give a very, very simple example right now of what, what has happened in the last couple of weeks and the use of social media, right? And social media has actually like how to manage our digital space better in terms of like, it's it made the world so ubiquitous that I can connect to you when you're using Zoom, I can connect to you at uh, any second or any minute at the time, no matter where you are now. Uh, uh, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, I can text you if I give, if I, if I uh, actually have your number on Facebook. But look at the privacy issues that have uh, cropped up in the last couple of months or years over the use of WhatsApp uh, into the integration of Instagram and Facebook. It has, the, it has intended consequences and the intended consequences are to mine your personal digital print, right? So I'm going to give it as a, uh, from two perspectives. As a user, you need to be cognizant of this is that once you have any online uh, account, you have a digital footprint. And it is your responsibility as to how you use it, whether you read the privacy issues uh, or privacy policies and, uh, and how you accept those policies. As the uh, inventor of uh, such technologies, we have to be cognizant also uh, what um, consequences that they do have. So we have to like foresee them and know the, the intended consequences they do have, uh, meaning like if you're going to use um, um, You use agriculture. Um, you use agriculture. Um, I mean, you use IoT devices like temperature sensors and um, other sensors for like soil moisture and temperature and water acidity. You know that it's going to help you uh, and the farmer in that case in terms of increasing the productivity of the farm. But there are some uh, consequences that you don't intend for and you cannot foresee them, but can you project them? So uh, uh, for him uh, and for me, like that has come to mind in the last couple of months. And I was like, oh my God, we actually need to like map out what are the uh, unintended consequences that this might have that we might not see. Uh, for example, AI might, uh, the social dilemma, which was re recently shown on uh, Netflix, for those who have not watched it, uh, actually say it's a must watch. You might get off Instagram after you've watched it. <laughs> I'm not alarming anyone, but at the click of a button, you all the time want to go when there's a push notification, you want to go in onto your, uh, devices all the time and see what's happening and even when there's no uh, messaging coming in you always want to like refresh and see what's going on it's literally making us like robots of ourselves uh in this day-to-day -day life the automation the use of um the the um, the AI of like Siri and Google Assistant. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. And I, I am a technologist at, at most, but I also, also I think there's a limit to how, uh, how much technology you can use in your day-to-day -day life. And uh, we have to be responsible enough to see where we can be more accountable for it uh, as inventors and what it has uh, the implicability test on users as well. Okay, perfect. Um, at this point in time, I'd just like to uh, remind the audience if they have any questions, please pop them into the chat. 
um, and we'll be more than happy to pick them up as part of the conversation. Um, and I guess, you know, uh, just uh, picking up from your point, Jessica, around the social media uh, sort of optimization that we find ourselves in, uh, it's been very much around, uh, you know, um, finding the balance between what becomes invasive and what isn't invasive from a technological standpoint. And, you know, having that uh, balance being drawn in. And again, that's one of those interesting ones like values where it's very much niche to each and every individual um, that is here. And I guess the transitioning that's happening in, in, in startups or corporates um, has been very much around from trust, um, you know, um, control and power into one of trust, transparency and fairness. And uh, that probably speaks large volumes uh, in terms of the mindsets for startups. And, you know, they already have a desire or a driving initiative to make impacts for humanity. They want to collaborate, they want to start businesses, um, but yet within the African context, we still find ourselves with a data rich sort of information poor scenario um, where digital ethics uh, is fast becoming our new state of reasoning, right? Um, so how does data ethics in itself um, actually influence how we responsibly innovate? Um, if I can pass that to Ms. Ida. Okay, sorry, come again on the last, the last part of what you need from me, please. Okay, sure. So how does the uh, digital ethics um, influence uh, how we responsibly innovate? Right. Um, yeah, definitely it's going to make a big difference if we start from that point. If we're going to start at the point where there is an ethical and a moral um, responsibility of what we are creating, then definitely the conversation, the tough conversation will have to happen. And for me, I feel that, okay, it should have happened way before, but again, this is, this is not a space we've been in before. So we seem to be creating things as we go. And we seem to be reactive. And um, just like you said, um, Davina, and also Jessica, that it seems like the situation has already caught up with us. So you have the case of WhatsApp and there are also some, some pretty alarming um, information going around. And I mean, from trusted point, uh, from trusted sources. I don't mean, I'm not talking about fake news here. From trusted sources, there's some alarming information coming through and to actually how much data is mined using the apps that we so willingly download or whether they are mobile apps, web apps, it doesn't matter, whatever we are using, whatever we're engaging with every day is actually, we put ourselves at a risk, not only of parting with our very private issues or things that we may not want other people to know about, but also can put us at risk of third parties who might use the data for nefarious reasons. So the conversation is happening now because it has already, we've already reached that point where data breaches are happening and they're happening big time. And then I'm not talking about even being a tech person, I'm just saying, have you ever looked at how much in terms of permission you give when you are going to use some of these apps? When you're talking about even giving permission to an app to be able to even have body sensors and be able to mine that information and you don't know what for, then I think it also needs to put the responsibility back to us. Of course, there's also the part of how transparent are these companies in making sure that the narrative has been put in a way that the user can understand. But then again, they might just give an answer of that is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to make sure it was done legally and it has already been sent out there for people to accept before using our products or services. So uh, it, it's sort of a, a catch-22, is it a catch-22 situation? Is that what people used to say? Because it shifts the responsibility from one, one person to the other. 
But then for me, I feel that by the time it has this conversation has reached this point, and because I also sit on a number of forums happening internationally, and I see the kind of catch up game that is trying to be played by every stakeholder, or even the passing the back in terms of responsibility, that tells me from my experience, it's already too late. It has so, yes, it means that the data, breach, the data breach is already, it's bad. It's just that we do not want to alarm the whole world into saying just how intrusive some of this information is in terms of how much it reveals about you. And we're not talking here about 20% levels. We're talking about almost everything, everything. And this is going to be very alarming when people realize just how much information that they thought was private is already out there in the hands of people who can use it for whatever reason that they want. Whether they use it as a first party or whether they give it to someone who is more interested in that kind of information. You're talking about a health scare that happened the, in the last year or so in terms of COVID. One argument would be that all this, when it comes to our health, in terms of all the sensors that are being used in terms of our heart rate, uh, our sleep uh, quality and all that, many apps have permissions to that if you did not know. But we, we, we could, they could put um, a caveat and say that we were actually, after mining the data, this, if a situation like COVID happened again, we would be better prepared to pass on this information to the healthcare providers or um, other stakeholders in the health system. But for me, I feel that that is just an excuse because that should have already happened if that was the case. So I feel that it's a conversation. I'm glad we are talking about it, but it's a big, it's a huge conversation, Lavina, and the vested interests are not small. No, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of this entire journey, it's never just uh, different segments of it. And, you know, when we talk about data ethics, it, we can also include things like data breach, as you mentioned, and data colonization, something that we don't speak very, uh, you know, um, very loudly about within Africa, uh, but it's happening uh, all around us. And, you know, even in terms of education and awareness, we, we say yes to a hundred websites that we go visit or a hundred apps that we download, uh, unknowingly um, not aware of the full consequences to it. Um, and, you know, having, taking us through a process where we become more educated, but the law actually is in place where the digital citizen is actually supported rather than the large uh, corporates uh, as previously is something that could be of value going forward. Um, if I could ask uh, everyone to pop into the chat. Um, so, so here's a question um, or a sentence rather, and I'd like for you to uh, complete it. It says humanity's journey starts with, um, and that could be related to responsible AI, or it could be something very generic. Um, any any thoughts from our speakers? Uh, you're more than welcome to share your thoughts. Um, so humanity's journey starts with Jessica. I think I'd like to say humanity's journey starts with having empathy. Uh, that's one thing that uh, as um, as a entrepreneur, as a technologist, I've learned over time. It's just not about building something that just works because you have a particular issue in time. But uh, uh, building humanity's journey starts with uh, the empathy, empathy uh, then followed by the technology. And the technology can be AI or any other mode of uh, okay. dissemination. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ida. I, I agree a hundred percent with Jessica. That's 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 amazing when she used the term empathy. I was just like, yeah, I think she's hit the nail on the head. And probably just I would just say emotional intelligence because um, that is also a part of um, empathy. The self awareness. I think the problems are mainly caused by we want to create the law after after the horse has bolted. Sorry. And it means that by then, 
the 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 creators of the technology have already come up with so many ways in which to evade or to or to sidestep the kind of tough questions that are going to come about so that's why i say that um the cre we, if we start I like the word she used, empathy, because this puts the responsibility in the hands of the creator of this technology. And it yeah. means that even, yeah, because they should have been thinking about what are the consequences even before getting to that point where the consequences are beginning to be such a, a house of cards. Yeah. So I think that's where we should have started. I think that's where we can still, we can still, we can still instill some of these things. We need the self-awareness and we need the self-management in terms of, for me, myself, am I really able, to, am, I, am I willing to put myself on the line in terms of, I knew this was happening and I did nothing about it. These are type of conversations we are going to have. So as I said, for me, before I exited, if someone had told me that what I was creating might have some totally negative consequences on other people's lives in the future i would have thought twice i really would have yeah. so i think the conversations should start happening now i don't think that's what i meant i successfully exited and there are other people who are responsible now but i would have i would feel terrible if there's nothing yeah. i can do and it's already out of my hands so for the people who the tech is still in their hands this is the right time for that conversation Perfect. So empathy and self-awareness. And um, one of the attendees actually, um, or two of them, I'll, I'll read out their responses. And one says that humanity's journey starts with awareness and a conscious appreciation of the environment around them, no more so that the impact to technology has on their ex existence. And I think that is really, really profound, uh, profound, having that consciousness around everything that you're doing or everything that you are being is uh, definitely the largest influencer in everything that we create. Um, John Davis um, says, while humanity's journey starts with uh, the knowledge of knowing where exactly you want to go to. Um, so that's really, really cool and some really nice responses. So thank you everybody for that. Um, I guess if I have uh, one more question, if I could put that out to uh, both Ida and uh, Jessica, it says here that, um, do you actually see any specific potential or challenges to innovating with responsible AI or AI for good? Uh, within the African context in particular. Ms. Jessica? Um, could you just repeat the question again so I have a, a good grasp of it? Okay, sure. Um, so it says, do you see any specific potentials or challenges uh, to innovating with responsible AI or AI for good within the African context in particular? Yeah, <laughs> I have a, <laughs> this is a topic of uh, probably debate, but uh, what I can, uh, what I can say about it is a, within the African context, we don't have um, the, the data all in one place. It's, it's actually fragmented. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say probably the data quality yeah, questionable, but uh, data data is what we even for us as a, a recruitment when we when we were doing recruiting, we had that issue of like not having all the data in one place, and that's one thing why we stopped automated recruiting. So, uh, like university data is still in PDF format, and we have to like really uh, scrape it off. So for me, I think it's like, if we really want to have like uh, AI working, first for number one, AI working and responsible AI working, we need to make sure all these quality checks uh, are being done to ensure that there's no corruption of the data or uh, misuse of the data uh, in some, some ways, because one system could use it differently and another system could use it differently. 
So I think um, a framework for uh, using data in a systematic way is also also needed, and that's what would make it more like responsible, accountable, reliable, all the words that that people put uh, in the previous chat. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Manuel who says that um, are there any sort of companies that we know of uh, in Africa that are actively working on changing and improving ethics in AI within Africa? And specifically, what are the tools that they are using uh, to provide AI for all? Um, do any of you ladies want to take that? Um, I have some, some thoughts around that, but... Um, Jessica or um, Ms. Ida? I, I let Ida or you take that. Okay. Um, so I think there are one or two different uh, organizations or companies locally um, that actually are working on it. And I'm happy to connect with you, post this to give you a list of them. Um, the kind of frameworks that they're using is very much a combined framework. I also am aware that there's a white paper being written around a specific framework, uh, ethical framework uh, for AI applications within Africa. So that's a pretty interesting uh, paper to come out soon. And um, so is there room for us to do more around it? Sure. Um, baseline ourselves against frameworks like the UNESCO or UNDP or uh, the SDG goals um, are, are somewhat of a baseline but they're not the actual uh, core of applications. And the applications is pretty much where we can, you know, gain the most benefit from uh, in terms of that. Uh, we have another question here, which says, um, how do we undo the complexities that are created by technology being on the forefront and regulators playing a catch up game, especially when it comes to empowering the end user? Um, Ms. Jessica, do you want to take that? Yeah, how do we, <laughs> what's <laughs> done is done. Uh, I don't think so, like, uh, when you say, how do we undo the complexities created by technology, um, what's done is done with tech. And as uh, human beings, we have to be, the best thing we can do as um, an owner or an inventor, a part of that technology is, to be accountable, be cognizant of what it has, the repercussions it has, whether good or bad, uh, whether there's a data breach, uh, answer for it, right? My, like Mark Zuckerberg answered for the Cambridge Analytica, although evasive and very still controversial to this day, um, face it, own it. Don't, don't shy away from it. You're the one who came up with it. And um, I think there are two in one questions here, how regulators can care. Regulators will always be behind <laughs> like <laughs> by one step. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite interesting to see like how regulation tries to catch up with uh, uh, the mobile money ecosystem. In, in various ecosystems, whether it's uh, Nigeria or, or Kenya, and how rigid it is in some places like Ethiopia, and the way you have to go to the bank to make a transaction or a certain, a certain aspect where you can't even use more of our money. Um, so I, I, I think the question is, the many that have been created. Yes, there are power dynamics that have been created. Uh, we we have uh, sometimes like we have create like technology can be the monster and we don't realize ten years later that you've created a, created a monster and then how do you account for this monster right uh, I I not give any specific examples but just watch the social dilemma uh, and you'll understand what I am talking about in terms of how social media has crept up in our lives and we don't actually realize it as the end user. The best thing to actually do is that these engineers who are actually creating these applications are coming to are in cognizance with it. They're like realizing, oh my God, what are we creating? So they're actually like getting out of those ecosystems and building uh, a 
a safety net or more uh, responsible technology to uh, protect the end user or actually even creating films uh, or documentaries to uh, uh, enlighten and educate the end user as well on this kind of technology. Yeah, no, um, it's quite interesting um, in terms of, you know, the power play that sort of comes around and the dynamics around it. And I think, you know, very much regulators can have an opportune moment to play catch up in terms of, you know, uh, finding the youth, including the youth, uh, finding those technologies that are going to bridge the gap even more uh, rather than a very much uh, sole or, or, you know, very small sort of um, technologies or implementations that they may use. And I think also collaboration. So sharing of technologies is also something that we could do very effectively. So as much as it's a copy paste idea, people do that because it's pretty much saving Absolutely. a lot of time. But we could also, you know, uh, emit all of that by actually collaborating and, and sharing and making the technologies available to each other, um, you know, whether it be on open source base or whether it be on, um, on not an open source base. Uh, but there's always room for that collaboration to leapfrog each other or situations or scenarios um, to everyone's benefit. I think we have another um, sort of question here that says that, um, you know, authorities sometimes are let down, uh, are let down as they are the first ones to abuse their citizen rights. And even in this case of responsible use of AI, it is still very evident that they are the prime suspects, um, you know, and I'd absolutely agree. I'd uh, ask every single one of you, uh, you know, while we're talking about watching of series, there was a series done by James Wood probably in 2012 uh, called uh, Futurescape. And I think it was in the first or second episode um, where they literally show you the opening scene of a humanoid going to uh, vote uh, and the humans are outside protesting. And, you know, that in itself is exactly this, um, you know, where and when do we draw the line um, in terms of allowing the authorities to have and continue to have as much control and power? Um, I don't know, Jessica, do you have any thoughts on that? Hi, Jessica. Okay. Seems like we have uh, lost um, Jessica for a moment. <laughs> um, so let's take on uh, the next question is, is there a major satellite down today or something? <laughs> Probably so, because we seem to be going intermittently between uh, uh, people dropping on and off the call. Um, so um, Ida, just to give you some sort of context, we were last talking around authorities and, and pretty much how much they are let down. And one of the questions were, um, you know, how do we sort of prevent this use of or abuse um, of digital citizenry rights? Um, and even in the case of responsible use of AI, um, you know, we still have many things that are in question, especially when it comes to politics, public governments, um, and the use around uh, data. So do you have any sort of thoughts on that? Okay, um, probably I would just like to highlight, as I highlighted before, that we need to start having the tough conversations where we actually hold the... Um, the different bodies accountable. We have to hold them accountable. And by this, I don't mean it, it's, you know, the reason why it's so difficult is because it's supposed to be a shared responsibility. It's not supposed to be the responsibility of only one party. And that means that um, government is a stakeholder. We have um, the international um, community being a stakeholder as well. We have civil society, and these are the people who have been pushing engagements especially when rights are being infringed, people who have actually been able to do it at, on the ground. And these are the bodies we need to get involved. And then we also need, of course, academia because of the research side of things. 
and as well as the kind of um, constituency that they hold within their institutions, which are the, the mostly the young people. And that's a great time for some of these things to be instilled. And uh, probably which other stakeholder have I left out at this, this particular point? Um, I would just talk about the user as an individual. This is just a shared responsibility. And that is where we are having such, it's a tough, we're having such a tough time because it's a shared responsibility. It's very hard to pinpoint one person as being the bad guy, right? Because it can always be thrown back to any other party. So if you have the, for example, the private sector already being ahead of the game, and if you start by making it all about um, those people who are in it for profit, then they could al also come back in terms of how much data have we, sh we shared even with your own governments, which they have used for good, which they have actually used for developmental purposes. Did they tell you what exactly they ended up using that data for? So you see, it starts becoming like, um, if, if we approach it, we don't approach it delicately, it will become a blame game because we have come to understand that uh, there are a lot of people who are really not to blame when it comes to, to these data breaches. But this is, this is my own personal opinion and uh, I welcome anyone yeah. else to chip in at this particular point, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think auditability is uh, definitely a topic uh, around AI um, that's going to add to this uh, enhancement of the ecosystem that we create or even the relationship uh, that we have between um, humans and, you know, the artificial intelligence. Um, another area could possibly be around, you know, data economy, uh, data privacy, data security, um, and all those things add layers upon layers uh, of value. Um, to what our end goal is. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions in the chat. Let me just quickly have a look through it. Um, no, perfect. Okay, so just to sort of wrap up then, I'd like to take the time to thank each of our guests for actually being here and uh, for their thoughts and time. Um, as a summary point, I think it's been very much around um, Let's have empathy. Let's show up and have empathy. Uh, let's be the enabler and let us engage people um, as part of uh, what we need to achieve. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of um, the Rain Africa um, sort of goal, I think the conversations today very much um, stemmed and spoke very directly to, to that. And just to reiterate, uh, the Rain Africa's main goal is around the collaboration across the different fields, countries and interests, uh, all in aim for uh, AI for good and um, startups, private sectors, public sectors, all included. Um, so I'd like to say thank you very much. And I'd like to hand back to, uh, to Jerry at this point. Okay. So we, we want to say a very big thank you to our moderator, Lavina Ramkisun for doing an excellent job. We also want to be grateful to all of you who made time of your busy schedule to join us in our Rain Africa workshop. We have another workshop coming up very soon and that is going to be on AI and energy, responsible AI and energy. The flyers will be out very soon and we want to encourage that you be on the lookout for it so that you can connect with us and we can continue to deliberate on how we can responsibly use AI for the good of humanity. So on this note, we want to bring this exciting time to a close and look forward to greater times ahead. Thank you very much for joining us and Bye-bye to each and every one of you. Thank you.